Good evening. Welcome. Um, really great to see you all tonight. My name is Anne Elgood. I'm the senior curator here at The Hammer. And it's my great privilege to introduce uh, our panelists tonight for the Hi A History of Refusal, Black Artists and Conceptualism. Before I introduce them, I'm just going to give a few announcements. Um, I want to remind everyone to silence their cell phones, if you would, please, and to refrain from taking pictures. Um, I also want to mention that this Sunday is the last day of the Charles Gaines exhibition, the Thomas Heatherwick exhibition, and the Pedro Reyes exhibition. So if you have not seen those shows, um, I encourage you to check them out before Sunday. Um, Next Sunday, May 31st, is the final day of our exhibition, Apparitions, Frotages, and Rubbings, from 1860 to Now, which is in our G4 gallery, and it's a really beautiful exhibition if you haven't seen that. And then I also want to mention that Charles Gaines' show at Art and Practice, which is the project that we are partnering with Mark Bradford and his partners on in Lamert Park, there is an exhibition of new work by Charles Gaines, and that is on view until Sunday, May 31st also. So please go check that out as well if you haven't already. I also wanted to um, tell you a little bit about our summer exhibitions that are coming up. And I will mention just one or two public programs that are in conjunction with those shows. But of course, there are many more. So please check out our calendar, our printed calendar, that hopefully all of you have, or go to our website. Um, opening on June 20th, we have Mark Bradford Scorched Earth. And on Sunday, August 2nd, there is a public program I'm extremely excited about, and I know you will be too. It's a conversation between Mark Bradford and Anita Hill. So yeah, kind of cool, right? Um, you probably want to become members if you're not already in order to get a ticket to that. And then we're also opening Perfect Likeness, Photography and Composition, which is curated by our adjunct curator and professor of art at UCLA, Russell Ferguson. And tomorrow night, Russell is actually giving a talk here in this very theater um, on his curatorial practice, and he'll touch upon some of the ideas that he's exploring in this upcoming show. Also on Sunday, June 28th at 2 p.m., there is a discussion with artists in that exhibition, Thomas Demand, Eli Elad Lassery, and Kathy Opie, who will be in conversation with Russell that afternoon. So I want to introduce um, our very esteemed panelists for tonight. This panel was organized by Jamila James um, and me around uh, in conjunction with the Charles Gaines exhibition. And it's really inspired, as the title indicates, by an exhibition that Charles did. Um, he actually curated and also wrote a very influential essay for the catalog. In 1993, it was an exhibition called The Theater of Refusal, Black Art and Mainstream Criticism. And the panel tonight is inspired by that, and I'm sure they will touch upon some of the ideas that Charles was um, entering to through that exhibition and through his accompanying text. Uh, Thelma Golden, who is one of the panelists but also will be moderating the discussion tonight, is, as I know you all know, the director and chief curator of the Studio Museum in Harlem, an art museum founded in 1968 whose mission is to serve as the nexus for artists and of African descent locally, nationally, and internationally. Golden began her career at the Studio Museum in 1987 before joining the Whitney Museum of American Art in 1988. In a decade at the Whitney, she was a member of the curatorial team for the now notorious 1993 Biennial. She organized numerous groundbreaking exhibitions, including 1994's Black Male, Representations of Masculinity in American Art, and served as director of the Whitney Museum at Philip Morris. She returned to the Studio Museum in 2000 as Deputy Director for Exhibitions and Programs and was named Director and Chief Curator in 2005. While at the Studio Museum, Thelma has organized many notable exhibitions, including Chris Ophelia, Afro Muses, 1995 to 2005, Black Romantic, Freestyle, Frequency, Glenn Ligon, Stranger, and Gordon Parks, A Harlem Family, 1967. Under her leadership, the Studio Museum has gained increasing renown as a global leader in the exhibition of contemporary art, a center for innovative education, and a site for diverse audiences to exchange ideas about art and society. Golden holds a BA in Art History and African American Studies from Smith College and honorary doctorates from the City College of New York, San Francisco Art Institute, Smith College, and Moore College of Art and Design. 
She was awarded a Medal of Distinction from Barnard College in 2010. And I could go on, but I'll stop there. Um, our next panelist is Rodney McMillan, who is an artist based here in Los Angeles. Rodney received his BFA from the Art Institute of Chicago and his MFA from California Institute of the Arts. He's had recent solo exhibitions at the Aspen Art Museum, Suzanne Vielmetter Gallery, Macaron Gallery in New York, and the ICA Boston. His work is currently featured in the Sharjah Biennale, and recent group shows also include When the Stars Begin to Fall, Imagination in the American South at the Studio Museum in Harlem, which was curated by Thomas Lax, uh, Roughneck Constructivists at the ICA Philadelphia, curated by Kara Walker, and Blues for Smoke at MOCA here in LA, curated by Bennett Simpson. And Rodney has many, many other exhibitions that I could add to that list. Hamza Walker, um, is currently on a two-year leave as being the Director of Education and Associate Curator for the Renaissance Society at the University of Chicago, where he's been working since 1994. And he's on leave, in fact, to be here in LA working as a co-curator with Aaron Moschietti on our next Made in LA exhibition, which is our Biennial of LA Artists, which will be in the summer of 2016. So we're really pleased to call Hamza part of our curatorial team for the next couple of years. Um, his recent exhibitions include Teen Paranormal Romance, which is currently on view at the MCA Santa Barbara until July 12th. The group show Suicide Narcissus, and a solo show with John Neff, both at the Renaissance Society in 2013. And again, I could go on. Hamza has many exhibitions and wonderful programs under his belt. He is the recipient of the 1994 Norton Curatorial Grant and the 2004 Walter Hopps Award for Curatorial Achievement. In 2010, he was awarded the Ordway Prize for contributions to the field in the form of writing and exhibitions. So please join me in warmly welcoming Thelma, Rodney, and Hamza. situated. Good evening. It is so fantastic to be here for so many reasons, but perhaps most because I'm sitting on the stage with these two dear and esteemed colleagues, and I am so looking forward to the opportunity to talk to them. Also thrilled to be here because I look out in this audience and see many, many, many familiar faces and friends and thrilled that you all came on this occasion um, for us to talk in and around the space created um, by Charles Gaines. I want to thank the Hammer Museum for um, having Charles Gaines grid work here at the Hammer, an exhibition curated by Na Naima Keith at the Studio Museum in Harlem. We are thrilled that it is here. We have been thrilled in working with Ann Elgood and Jamila James and the entire team here, and I really want to thank my colleague, Annie Philbin, for uh, making that possible. Also thrilled that it's happening at the same time as an exhibition of Charles's new work at Art and Practice. Uh, Mark Bradford, Alan DeCastro, and Eileen Norton's fantastic space in Lamert Park that's happening in collaboration with this project as well. I also have to say this is you know, a weird bit of coincidence that we are here in the um, sort of spring of 2015 because it is when my exhibition Blackmail was actually here at the Hammer in 1995. So here, 20 years later, right? Mm -hmm. Hard, and hard. And when did it open? The day, the, but the day the is significant. I know, see, huh? see th this is what this is gonna be, right? <laughs> because in some ways, you know, a whole, you know, part of my brain exists kind of in surrogacy with Hamza, right? <laughs> that, that, you know, he incubates and has all the amazing thoughts I might have. And so you're right, it happened, the opening was the first day of jury selection in the O.J. Simpson chart. So. Here in LA. Yeah. That's exactly right. But we are here today to sort of look at this question <laughs> of you know, how we can understand through Charles' work this idea of black artists and conceptualism. And I have to begin by saying we would not be here without Charles Gaines. 
No, say it again. We would not be here without Charles Gaines. Yeah, me for real. <laughs> we would not. <laughs> All of us. We yeah. would not be here, yeah. right? Yeah. Without Charles Gaines. So to have this conversation means we are first having a conversation about the utterly central role Charles has had in the intellectual development of this idea of what the space can be to think about these ideas in art. And I think, very importantly for me, to imagine that the sort of space of an idea of art about ideas, and art about ideas that can be informed by race and identity, is the space I've been working in as a curator, and certainly the space that created the exhibition that I made in 1994 at the Whitney that came here to the Hammer, Blackmail. But really, more importantly for me, the base that that came from was Charles's Theater of Refusal, where he set out for us a sort of rigorous idea of thinking about not just the space we existed in, but really predicted the spaces we would have to create in order to understand and really fully engage with the depth and the power of the work created by black artists. So tonight, what we hope to do is have a conversation. Um, again, I'm going to say you know, my real excitement at sitting here with Rodney and Hamza, both minds that I appreciate and respect so much. We're going to begin um, with both of them speaking a little bit as a way to just set some terms, perhaps, of where we might start. And then I'm going to ask them some questions that we hope will kind of open up what we know is really not a conversation that we can begin and end in this moment, because it certainly is a conversation that's been going on for t more than 20 years. But we hope that we are able, perhaps, to cite it in the beautiful space created in this moment by Charles's work. Okay. Sure. Hamza. Yeah. So these are just introductory remarks. Um, and I think Thelma's remark about not being here or being here because of Charles is uh, actually how I end things in a way. Uh, but I just prepared this just as a way to get the conversation going. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was actually written in polemical fashion, in part, um, for you two. Black is a modifier, it usually signifies a particularized, ethnicized, racialized variation of its object, no matter how big the category. Black art, black people, black music, black women, black males, black lives, the black church, the black body, the black family, black Los Angeles, black intellectuals, black speech, black thought, black aesthetics, black power. And now, black conceptualism. <laughs> The emphasis in these designations usually falls on the ontological object, in this case, conceptualism, a movement whose notable features of preponderance with language, systems, and seriality represented a sustained assault on visuality and or the dematerialization of the art object. That's pretty much the standard party line. And this is a party. <laughs> But what if the emphasis in black conceptualism fell more squarely and decisively on black as an historical category, a category that entails the configuration and reconfiguration of subjectivity come again as perpetually emerging, as a perpetually emerging self from Negro to new Negro to colored to black to African American. Black becomes something of a drag coefficient on its ontological object, conceptual art, grounding it in a sequence of historical events that ultimately call into question the notion of an autonomous art upon which modernism itself rests. This conundrum is nothing new. Abstraction, shorthand for an autonomous art, has always been problematized by race which threatened abstraction's promise to transcend national, cultural, ethnic, and or linguistic specificity. A generation of artists a shade to a half generation older than Charles resorted to abstraction precisely because it allowed them to be artists rather than be qualified as black artists, a qualification that took on increasing urgency over the course of the civil rights movement. Think about the Boys Club, 
Jack Witten, Al Loving, William T. Williams, Sam Gilliam. This, however, is a puzzle piece in a much larger picture I'm trying to paint. If black, when it comes to 20th century art movements, is emphasized over the object it modifies. Again, as an historical category, black refers to a perpetually emergent subject as signaled in the changes of self-designation, Negro, new Negro, colored, black, African-American. I'm proposing that anything modified with black be accountable to an ever-emergent subject over and above in our historical narrative privileging autonomy. Charles's work is dyed in the wool conceptual, to be sure, but there are no stakes there at all. Its consideration within the swath of artistic movements, however, from the Harlem Renaissance to a latter-day black nationalism, is where the beef and the dialectical rub, as it were, reside. This might seem like an argument for consideration of Charles's work within a black art history, or is it an African-American art history, or a post-black art history, or a black art post-history? <laughs> Practically speaking, it is probably any and all of these, but even within these schema, Charles's work is a key rejoinder, taking on the contours of a larger intergenerational project. I think that's exactly what you were saying, we think. We actually wouldn't be here if it weren't for Charles. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's much more important than uh, the consideration of the work as it relates to a singular movement. Mm -hmm. As he was one of the first people to whom I gave an overview of Black Is, Black Ain't, which actually I've told very few of any people, I count myself amongst a generation that will always be in Charles's debt. So thank you. Hi there. I wrote a little something. Um, uh, I thought I'd start with an email that Charles sent. Um, I'm going to, I, I studied with him and I, in my, base my writing and my talk uh, through what I learned from him. And um, I thought it was fitting to, to start with an email that he sent upon um, Solowit's passing because uh, he considered Solowit uh, uh, a mentor and it influenced so much of his practice. And so this is an email that was sent, um, I think it was in 2007. Um, as you know by now, Saul Lewitt just died yesterday. Saul was a personal friend who was singularly responsible for my career. I knew he had been sick for a long time, and for the last year I had not been able to talk to him directly because his cancer got worse. But I sent him email messages reminding him how important he was to me. I taught a class here at CalArts titled Saul Lewitt last year. A friend told me this morning that he died and I was crushed. In 1976, he introduced my work to both John Weber and Leo Castelli, who both wound up representing me. And he, was assist and he had assisted me so many times financially when I was going through rough moments, and there were many, either by buying work or just sending me money, no strings attached. He also made his loft in New York available to me anytime I needed it to use it. Saul was the most generous person I know. His passing leaves an enormous hole for me personally, and I dare say to the world of contemporary art, Thanks for reading my small tribute, Charles Gaines. And um, I started with that because uh, so many of uh, uh, the tenets and like uh, the, paragra the paragraphs of conceptualism, uh, Charles uh, took to heart. Um, but what was really fascinating is how he expanded upon uh, those ideas to include ideas around representation so that, uh, so that there could be space for uh, artists of color and, and, and gendered minorities. And so um, I'll read a, a portion of what I wrote. Uh, I'm going to first quote the, first, the fourth paragraph from um, Paragraphs of Conceptualism. It's short. Uh, quote, art that is meant for the sensation of the eye primarily would be called perceptual rather than conceptual. This would include most optical, kinetic, light, and color art. My response is, was hallelujah. Um, focusing on the ideas that an artwork has instead, wait, Focusing on the ideas that an artwork has instead of the form it carries enables art to be critical. It enables art to exist within the realm of criticality, which we can all use to gain knowledge. It actually enables a conversation as opposed to shutting down a conversation. How does one engage in a discussion about an artwork if all that can be said is that it is beautiful? Well, why is it beautiful? What does beautiful even mean? Charles's endeavor is to point out that sometimes what we believe has been provided to us by others who have defined beauty for us. 
It's akin to Erica Badu singing, you don't have to believe everything you think. We've been programmed. Wake up, we miss you, from the song Healer Hip Hop. Charles shows us how perceptual art works. He also shows us that perceptual art is a political art in and of itself. It is political because it maintains the status quo in regards to who determined value and what value is, is forefronted. It is a scenario out of The Wizard of Oz. We don't get to engage with the little man behind the curtain. We are charged to simply obey that little man's dictums. A strategy in Charles's own work employs a, a seriality and systems to refute modernist traditions of the autonomous object. He wanted to challenge the idea that real art is an act of self-expression or a form of authenticity. His works are derived from predetermined strategies that don't require that he use his hand in a gestural way. This was and is still counter to how value is placed in art today. Today, the idea of the gesture and pathos of the artist is still deemed as a preferred form of expression. Also, his removal of that type of emotional gesture challenges the idea of the genius. Many folks today still locate artistic genius in an individual who has a superpower to imbue an artwork with an emotion. Many people believe that an art object is not legitimate if we can't attach an emotion to it. However, if you see a beautiful tree in the gallery upstairs, it's not because Charles set out to make a beautiful image. We see it as, a be we see it as beautiful because we have been trained to see it that way. He made an image based on a system, and we are left to figure out our response to the aesthetics produced. I view this as a political act. Fantastic. Thank so, you, Rodney. Yeah. Thank you. So the space perhaps to begin as the question is the question asked of us in the, in the title of this panel itself. And you already, Hamza, have sort of created the sense of the problematic of the modifier black in front of whatever we might consider. But is there a black conceptualism? Is there something that we can name or bracket mm -hmm. in time, in space, or through artists that not only we can name, but it is comfortable doing so and productive mm -hmm. for writing a new art history? Uh, uh, you, yes, and I think you answered the question at the very end of the question for me, in, in, for writing a new art history. And I was calling it, in quotes, like a black art history, <laughs> you know, but only you know, I mean, having written more, but keeping that very abbreviated, uh, again, raising the stakes on how, how is that new art history, where would we begin with a, the new art history in, in some sense? And, you know, I, Bennett Simpson, it's very sweet that he is here tonight in Blues for Smoke. I caught him off guard in, in terms of one measure of praise about the show was that I didn't think it was a show. I thought it was actually a proposal for a museum hanging, um, in, in which case it was, it actually seemed to remove, in some sense, conceptual work like the blues as a way, as a thread mm -hmm. to follow figuration, um, you know, from some indeterminate period. So when I was thinking, like, is this show, is it a period show? When does this work begin? Is it Blues for Smoke works from 1950 to 2013 or something. And it didn't have that at all as the subtext for me. As much as like, wait a minute, what if we actually kind of took minimalism and conceptual art out of the picture, mm -hmm. actually looked at another way of kind of talking about figuration, really mixing it up in terms of the mix of artists. Um, it felt like a proposal for a kind of new art history or reimagining about how a hanging of a permanent collection might be in a way. So. Is a black conceptualism important for you to understand your practice, Rodney? No, but what's important for me are conceptual artists who deal with issues around race and identity. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't really subscribe, I mean, it's hard for me to subscribe to like the idea of a black conceptualist, but I, but I do believe in conceptual practices made by black people and like what those works have like offered me as a possibility. And maybe the reason why I phrase it that way is because I think you mentioned something earlier about the idea that um, uh, that is that we as subjects are constantly shifting, and so and maybe it's a problem with the work. Like maybe it's all the words, like yeah. all of those uh, defining wor wor like words that are built on 
those like different categories, like conceptualism itself. But um, I think part of what I strive for, what I'm looking for, and what I see in the works that that really move me is that they offer a possibility for me to understand and move through them and also to learn from them. And they seem to, um, through their specificity in terms of the content, they seem to offer pathways for many people uh, throughout the world from what I've seen. I mean, because there's so many conceptual practices going on all over the world, you know, from Middle East to Asia to Latin America. I mean, th so I, I, I kind of see it, um, I guess, more as a political kind of position. Mm -hmm. And so from that space, um, it seems a bit more permeable. And I think what you're speaking of makes me want to just in this space acknowledge that we learn so much about this sort of potential of the global around this from our um, very sadly recently departed colleague Jane Farver, her oh. major exhibition, Global Conceptualism, yeah. right? Which sort of created this space. You know, I am, you know, perhaps um, as someone charged with defining a space of cultural specificity, I am intrigued by creating these categories. Mm -hmm. I feel like they offer some possibility for a major redefinition. You know, one of the most important things for me about um, having the Gaines exhibition at the Studio Museum was the way in which it both opened up our future, but also was a very rigorous critique of our past, because quite literally, the work that's in the show, when it was made, would not have been shown. Was not shown, right, I shouldn't right. say would not have been. Yeah. Like yep. The fact, let me put a fact on it, was not shown mm -hmm. at the Studio Museum in Harlem at that time, right, in the yeah. late 60s. Right. And the early 70s, our founding moment. And for me, that's why this idea of digging into this question is so important. Because it seems to me the question of a new art history is also a question of our art history. Mm -hmm. How yeah. do we write our art history without some of the orthodoxies? Right, right. right? Yeah, it's it's all, I mean, to, to understand Charles Gaines as, as in relationship to, say, Norman Lewis, mm -hmm. right? So you've got somebody who goes from socialist realism to abstraction, mm -hmm. right? So you've got, and, and, and to think about that even on the heels of the Harlem Renaissance, so, you, you know, the, 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 emergence of the new Negro, right, a kind of, uh, 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 you know, a new subject in some sense. Um, but to think about Charles as another chapter, again, like when I painted it as a continuum, like it's like, okay, now we're gonna go from a you know, kind of dismantling of subjectivity Right, under the rubric of conceptual art to then like a critique of subjectivity into the 80s. So again, this intergenerational thing, but mm -hmm. to see him, it's like Charles is a linchpin for being able to like pivot back, mm -hmm. you know, in the 60s and also then to pivot forward to the, you know, Rodney, to, to our generation is completely, completely key. But, yeah, but again, to not, um, uh, to be able to insert him in that kind of a continuum, I think is really, really important, even if at the moment of the late 60s and early 70s, mm -hmm. 70s the work wasn't shown, you mm -hmm. know, in terms of its initial reception mm -hmm. as being outside of some kind of canon, mm -hmm. you know, of black art. Mm -hmm. you know. I mean, mm -hmm. it's really interesting too, because like, I, I, he mentioned once, like he was in a show in 1978, I can't remember where it was, in, in Connecticut, and um, he was invited to attend. I mean, he was in the show, but at the dinner, he wasn't actually invited to go to the dinner because they found out that he was black. Because when they, dis when they saw the work, you know, the curator knew he, he was, but the other participants and the persons who um, organized the dinner um, did not know. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, his, I don't want to say his work is deceptive in that re in regard, because it's not that, it's just, it is what it is. And it's just uh, what people put onto it or how they what, they, what their expectations about what a person of his subject mm -hmm. hood should be producing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a phenomena that I still find fascinating when people um, come to the Studio Museum and see any number of exhibitions of all kinds of practices, and they say to me that it does not look black. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just as a note, just so you understand mm -hmm. relationships. Whenever I have ideas like that, I usually, Hamza is the person I tell it to, because he can make a show out of that. <laughs> I just realized that. That's like a show, Hamza. Oh, yeah. All right, like, look black. That, like, what is? 
<laughs> what, right? Com- completely. But I think it is, you know, it is that idea of, you know, what, what are the terms of the practice? But, you know, some of this is also made out of a narrative of exhibitions, right? And mm-hmm. one of the things right. that we are responding to tonight is Charles's uh, exhibition, but also the conference um, that came out of it, which led to the book, The Theater of Refusal. Right? which really set out to define some space for a group of artists, right. which really, in some ways, define the terms that we're talking about right now, right. 20 yeah. years ago, yeah. right? Yeah. Exactly. Did you see that show, Hamza? No, no, I did not see Theater Refusal, but no, the, the catalog and the writings that came out of the, which are completely seminal, which is why I showed him the first cut on Black is Black Ain't when mm-hmm. I came out to mm-hmm. specifically to talk to Rodney about the chair, yeah, right. which mm-hmm. which we got into a beautiful tug of war about. Yeah. <laughs> like, um, you know, when I had requested if I could put the chair in the exhibition, Black is Black Ain't, Rodney said, no, the chair's not black. I was like, well, there is black, the ain't part, Rodney. <laughs> and and, and he, said, he said, you know, it's not, I, I don't know, I don't know. So I said, okay, I'll just come out to Los Angeles, sit down face to face and talk with you about about why I wanted to include it, he, you know, he agreed after we'd had this, had this, had this discussion about it. But after I met, right after I met you, I went and saw Charles mm-hmm. and showed him the first cut, mm-hmm. you know. And he was, he was, it's like giving your writing to an editor, mm-hmm. you know, because I specifically wanted him to mm-hmm. say, it's like, oh no, don't, you know, I don't, this I don't see the relationship, da, da, da. Mm-hmm. and he was crucial to the show. Mm-hmm. That chair is an interesting thing to talk about because, <laughs> you know, for me, um, when your chair was in the exhibition Frequency, which mm-hmm. was curated by Christine Y. Kim, mm-hmm. who's here tonight, it was a space in which to talk about this idea with our varying audiences. Mm-hmm. You know, the Studio Museum has, from its founding, been committed to this idea that we can create a space to speak about art in its many dimensions, right? Mm -hmm. Art through a conversation about aesthetics, art through a conversation about ideas, art through a conversation about culture, history, the public. And your sculpture really created some of, for me, the most profound ways in which to speak about art without speaking about art, Mm -hmm. right? To allow for um, an object and the idea of an object to sort of open many people to their own sense of understanding, even interpretation. Hmm. Talk a little bit about your strategy of art making um, in a way that we take the word conceptual off of it, but what essentially is the strategy with which you make your work? Well, I think there are multiple strategies. I'll I'll speak first directly about the chair. Um, I found that chair on Mecca and Sunset, and so it was in front of um, an apartment building. So there's no telling where, whose home that chair came from. It mm-hmm. just came out of a person's house who was of lower economic status. And so that was my response to like why um, I wouldn't qualify it as black. Because at that time, and still am, really, I was really um, invested in the idea of like looking at class and looking at how we uh, designate uh, different class systems, but also how we pathologize the poor. And um, there's mm-hmm. such a, um, an imbalance in terms of like how, who we think of when we think of poor people. You know, most of the images I see on the news when they speak of poor people, they're usually like black people or people of color. But actually, like in this country, just statistically, there are more like Euro-ethnic Americans who are poor or working poor than there are anyone else, just because of the numbers. And so um, that was my relationship to that piece. Mm -hmm. Um, But in regards to my practice, um, it's just from, uh, it it depends upon a a kind of overarching uh, theme that I may have. Like like recently with the Suzanne show, I was um, really interested in ideas around the Southern strategy, um, which was like a a politic used uh, through Nixon and and Reagan uh, as a way of like galvanizing um, uh, a middle class and and, and working class whites to, um, and poor whites too, uh, uh, through race baiting to, in order to like get them to vote uh, for uh, uh, the policies that they were interested in, mostly policies that, that were kind of antagonistic to their own needs. Mm-hmm. And so with that show, I came up with, with different strategies in terms of videos right. and mm-hmm. paintings and those kinds of things. And so it's usually about attach, like attacking an issue or at least addressing an issue through multiple forms. And I see that space as as one where 
not only is it hard to categorize, uh, or like, it was hard to categorize the maker, which mm -hmm. is, I think is important, has been important for me, but it's also, it perhaps opens up different entryways to the discussion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If that answers it at all, it yeah. does. That's yeah. funny. You made me take the chair with the painting. Yeah, that was the deal. You oh, said, the, yeah, "Oh yeah, yeah, you, you yeah, said you said you can't have the chair. Yeah. You, you, you get if you get the chair, you have to take this painting, which is a, the still it was a still life, life of a right. series of uh, of of books, mm -hmm. um, um, and it was the secrets of the temple, uh, 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 four good, time good times. Cosby. Uh, Cosby's yeah. biography you had it was in the, in the Fords or something the like Fords that, yeah. yeah 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 but I, I I remember talking to you about the, uh, the that it was a, a a negation of a of a of a of a black aesthetic hmm. it, and the idea that it did the yeah. fact that it didn't didn't participate in a sort of transformation uh, of of you know, found object, mm -hmm. right? Something that had been discarded, it's transformed, and then now it's a thing of beauty or that has value as an allegory, mm -hmm. you know, um, for, you know, dignity and uplift of the race kind of thing, you know, mm -hmm. that that's, the, mm -hmm. but the idea that the chair did not undergo that kind of transformation, that it was mm -hmm. simply, it's like, no, it's fucked up here, and now it's fucked up <laughs> right, over here, right. see? There's no, right. like, you know, no, mm -hmm. no. The transformation <laughs> was the relocation. <laughs> 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 you know, and right. I, that was when you say, you say, I'm cool with that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, with the, on the racial, mm -hmm. but it was for, very nice to have this. Yeah. 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 And that makes me mm -hmm. want to ask you, Hamza, about your exhibition, Black is Black Ain't. Because if we're talking about a kind of idea of coming to some narrative history of these ideas about black conceptual practice, the question of a black aesthetic, to me, these questions are sort of written through a set of exhibitions. And mm -hmm. Black is Black Ain't certainly um, stands as central to that. So can you talk about what that exhibition intended, how it started? I mean, I remember mm -hmm. when it was another exhibition. Oh, yeah. Uh, before. Right, right. That's it, right. You remember, yeah. Before yeah, it became right. Black is Black Ain't. Yeah. But can you talk a little bit about that exhibition for those who haven't seen it or those who have so that they can understand you know, what you were offering us mm -hmm. um, in making it? Yeah, it was. I mean, it was extremely discursive, like you said, in, in in terms of its relationship to other exhibitions. So, particularly freestyle, black male, black romantics. So, uh, um, uh, Tyler Stallings, uh, 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 whiteness, a wayward construction. Uh, uh, Maurice Bird did a show on whiteness in uh, Baltimore, um, but that was. Uh, it specifically, at the end, thinking about where freestyle had sort of left off with uh, 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 a kind of pluralism. There's a generation of, of young black artists who, who are no longer obligated to address race. So, so the flip side of that coin, you know, Elvis has left the building. But to me, it was like, but the building is still there. <laughs> like, even though Elvis has left, I actually mm -hmm. want to talk about the building. You know? So that was part of um, uh, of what, in terms of initiating mm -hmm. a, a dialogue with you specifically. But mm -hmm. the, uh, the other side is that you just couldn't have, I, there was a tacit, um, part of freestyle about their, you, you, you couldn't have an exhibition of all black artists double as an exhibition about race any longer. Right. That I felt like that that's actually what the gauntlet that was being thrown down mm -hmm. by that show. Mm -hmm. And I felt obligated to then say, no, 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 no. There was the show and there were the artists who came out of that show. Mm -hmm. But the upshot of this other thing is like, oh no, we're going, you know, this is now part of a continuum and a discussion and a dialogue. But now let's actually try and talk about the thing about race without, you know, mm -hmm. you know, where are we gonna go with this? How how is this gonna be done and structured? So that was really the the, mm -hmm. the the kind of start of the thing. And it also coming at the end of a kind of exhausted identity politics. Mm -hmm. That's what I felt like the nineties had pretty much fully run its a certain course, mm -hmm. um, uh, which then became interesting to me about what happens at the end of that. Mm -hmm. You know, now how do we begin to you know, do a group exhibition that would sort of, you know, I don't know, cubist fashion, um, uh, try and try and open it up as a 
as a as a discourse, no longer about like victimhood, you know, like it seemed like the topic of race could be such a downer. You know, I remember Huey and Darby both being, oh man, you're gonna do that? Like, you know, <laughs> like, like with this real like sadness, but to say, no, 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 no. I think it could be actually constructive. I think it could be fun and you know, yeah. dynamic to kind of engage, you know. So not not think about those things. So those that was pretty much a lot of what was on the table, mm -hmm. you know, just at that at that time. But it was a group exhibition. I think it was 20, 20, 20 some, 26, 20, 22, 23 artists. Mm -hmm. that, you know, mm -hmm. But just thinking about black conceptualism, the inclusion of, of Terry Atkins, you know, mm -hmm. that time specifically as a kind of texture that I wanted in the show after talking with him about, man, you remember how Terry, you <laughs> talk to Terry, I'm like, man, why you got to do that, man? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, this, this, this is a way of, yeah, again, right? Yeah. <laughs> Everything's got to be about the body, man. I don't want you to have all these figurative pieces in that show. You know, mm -hmm. I said, no, Terry, you know, specifically. So yeah. his piece in the show, the Mao with the tape decks, mm -hmm. you know, about W. E. Boys and called Dark Water Records, but to try and um, uh, have a whole a range of textures. Talk about the city. Talk about the dismantling of the housing projects in Chicago. Mm -hmm. That's an important thing. So to try and get at it from a, just a number of different uh, of different angles mm -hmm. you know, was the was the goal ultimately. Mm -hmm. Did you feel that you owed it to a generation of artists to create a more significant, more rigorous, more sophisticated space in which to acknowledge race and identity in an exhibition? In so far as that an older model mm -hmm. of exhibition with all black artists was trying to, you know, could no longer contain this discussion, so I actually mm -hmm. reinstituted quotas. Yeah. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? You know, so I think I got it like 55, 45, I care, mm -hmm. something like that. But mm -hmm. in terms of non black to black artists. But the, um, that was, uh, not necessarily in terms of a more sophisticated dialogue. I don't. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But as far as not going back and having the show not be all black artists, and that wouldn't cut it anymore. Mm -hmm. To make a break and to want the show to register as that kind of break, that was important. Mm -hmm. I have a question yeah. for you guys. Um, yeah. Since you're on the other side from where I work in certain ways, I'm wondering. Uh, in talking about identity politics and talking about a. I guess in the early aughts and things about like how there's a shift in terms of like uh, an expectation of what kind of shows uh, could be with black artists. I'm wondering now where like wh what are just like where are you in relationship to like that discourse from um, from the early nineties that that identity based uh, work uh, that had so much uh, that was so much in sync with the times in terms mm -hmm. of like the music, the films, uh, the writing that was done mm -hmm. that was uh, very germane to this kind of like, you know, in some ways, somewhat aspirational moment. Mm -hmm. And now we're in a different time period where it's, at least from my end, it's, it feels a little less aspirational. Mm -hmm. um, it's a little bit dire. Well, mm -hmm. actually, it's been dire, but it's like uh, we're finally seeing a lot more uh, images and like histories about what's actually happening here. And I'm wondering, uh, how then do you construct your programming or your curatorial practice? Like, wh like where is your, um, I guess, how do you, how do you cite? I guess I'm just wondering, like, how do you respond to like now? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Just, just get to it, Roger. <laughs> how do you respond to now? Just, just ask the question. Yeah. Hamza, how do you respond to now? I mean, I don't, I don't, I, in a very simple way. It, Professionally, in some sense, I mean, you know, artists lead, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, in another way, and I kind of follow. Mm -hmm. And that's why, you know, I kind of liked working at a moment where I thought things were kind of exhausted. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, um, uh, that's what I got out of that David McKenzie video of Babel, of just him breathing with the microphone, mm -hmm. you know. So, um, but, you know, can this, you, you, you know, I mean, with contemporary art, like the assumption that, now can achieve the present that this moment can achieve a kind of um, legibility. I think is a very big assumption, right? Like that it's not, um, uh, and that you know what what again to f to to follow, like to wait and wait, you know, as far as see what comes out of this moment. Um, uh, 
it being, I don't think that what's going on is actually anything new per se. I think that the attention being called on, on it is new. Correct. If you were to actually look at the statistics, it it's like, I don't think, yeah. right, exactly. Yeah. It's like in some sense to be able to use the phrase, mm -hmm. ain't a damn thing changed, like in right. another way. But right. so now it's just like, no, 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 no. The spotlight is on this. So the work is already kind of there, mm -hmm. you know, in another way. So the, it would be much more about a critique of representation, like how this stuff is being mediated with social media and you know mm -hmm. pictures everywhere mm -hmm. and it, and that's the that's more the phenomenon than the content itself which is quite interesting in terms of that thing but it points to all kinds of tacit issues to me about you know race um, and and things that don't get said about popular perceptions relationship to police that I never thought you know, um, talking to white friends or colleagues is like, oh, no, 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 no. That's, you know, the kinds of things in finding out, it's like, oh, God, I grew up with this whole other idea in my head or general attitude or relationship towards that thing. You know, things of talking to Terry Adkins, being told by your father, is like, oh, man, if you run, like, run stop with the cops like don't like don't keep running mm -hmm. do not do that mm -hmm. and the idea that it's like oh i grew up with that mm -hmm. like just as a general mm -hmm. you know here's the download this is what you do it's not mm -hmm. you know yeah. just as like a common sense way of mm -hmm. being and how to negotiate those kinds of situations that i just thought was like you know kind of a common sensical kind of thing but come to you know in terms of talking with people are like really it's like yeah of course that's yeah. kind of like a given you know the double consciousness yeah thing. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Just, you know and this stuff kind of yeah. is like a raking light yeah exactly you know on a lot of this yeah stuff and especially I went high school in Baltimore so yeah, yeah. I am um, you know I have to say I've been having a lot of nostalgia for the 90s mm -hmm. right I have um <laughs> you know I um, maintained, a, you know, a really complicated relationship to black male for the 19 years after it opened, mm -hmm. um, up until, you know, everyone made me say, oh, it's 20 years. And I had to kind of acknowledge, it is well known that I um, don't read the reviews of my exhibitions, so did read the black male reviews about a year ago for the first time and um, read one of them, um, the New York Times Review, out loud on a stage at the Guggenheim um, oh, wow. as a way to exercise, <laughs> having not read them for 20 years. And, you know, also, you know, with the um, new Whitney opening and sort of being on that floor and sort of, you know, Fred Wilson's guarded view, um, which was in blackmail mm -hmm. on view, mm -hmm. and David Hammond's Exactly, David mm -hmm. Hammond's, you know, fantastic sculpture mm -hmm. and many other works that came into that collection during um, that moment of my time there has made me think about that moment and remember the sense of urgency, the mm -hmm. sense of utter sort of, you know, radical commitment towards active everyday change. Um, it may it makes me sort of remember the terms were so high everything you know felt as if it was a long time coming mm -hmm. yes but still you know had the potency mm -hmm. um, of being first so I've been thinking about that a lot right because you know being back in that mm -hmm. moment um, in terms of you know how do you respond to now I am deeply intrigued personally and institutionally in this moment that we are in a moment that should not be characterized as new right because we mm -hmm. understand the sort of brutality against mm -hmm. you know black male and female bodies mm -hmm. let's say that um, in this country for a long time but I am interested in the way in which it lives in the world and the effect it will have on mm -hmm. a kind of art making mm -hmm. that we have yet to see Great. right and um, and as you know the director of the studio museum in Harlem I see us as being a place that's going to have to be particularly attuned Mm -hmm. to looking for and understanding what that possibility. But how do you stay involved with the now? It really is artists. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, really, 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 the reason um, I did freestyle was similar to really what Hamza said. I felt like after the 90s, I was exhausted. Mm -hmm. Like I was truly exhausted. And it's because we were so deeply, you know, sort of multicultural, right? I, 
about mm. a year ago. When did that um, Black Collecti Collectivities co uh, Conference oh, yeah. happen? Uh, a year ago, year and a half. And I, um, I heard that Hamza gave, as always, a very sort of mm -hmm. cogent talk at that conference. And it made yeah. me laugh, because I was thinking back in the days when we didn't really need to have conferences, right? Because it was only yeah. like <laughs> a few of us, right? We could just be in a room and talk, conference. right? <laughs> and that was, right? Uh, yeah. I mean, that's yeah. the truth of it. Yeah. That was the space in which we were working, right? We mm -hmm. sort of were interconnected to each other doing this work, but it didn't sort of form mm -hmm. itself in some ways that required that. And what I value about this moment and look back to sort of freestyle and say, well, I got to the Studio Museum in 2000. Christine Kim came shortly after I got there. We began working on what became essentially, you know, the first um, group exhibition to happen there. It really was just to set terms to allow for an openness of saying how to exist in the now of that mm -hmm. moment. But I do think it was one that also had to acknowledge itself around deeply embracing the history that had been written, but perhaps not acknowledged or documented. Right? So I'm not mm -hmm. saying all mm -hmm. these histories are documented, but the history that had been written by so many artists mm -hmm. who had come before and shown there. So that's what, you know, I think keeps me engaged, you know, in the now. Mm -hmm. I am, I mean, I'm intrigued by, you know, Hamza's idea, though, that we have to change the terms of mm -hmm. how we think about it and how we talk about it. I mean, there was a time when Black is, Black ain't was blackness without blacks. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. right. Remember oh, that? Yeah, when yeah, that was yeah. that's what right. that, that was the title. That was that's the, the title, title was yeah, going yeah, to be. Yeah. And I think I told you that couldn't <laughs> yeah. be the title. I was like, yeah. oh Hamza, please no that that oh, I, oh, yeah, that's, right. Right. <laughs> that's right. You did. Yeah. You did. I was accused actually with teen teen paranormal romance. This, this one guy came to the opening and he's yeah. like, there are no teens in the show. Right. And I was like, no, this is not no, yeah. no, no. And he was like, that'd be like doing a a Mexican muralist show with no Mexicans right. in it. <laughs> and right. I was like, oh, oh my God. I'm like, I'd actually like to see that show. Kind yeah. of like, <laughs> right. And I felt really bad afterwards with that. Right. Like, right. like you saying, it's like, no, no. Right. But I think what you were formulating there was an idea of, again, trying to somehow wrestle with this sort of great, whether it's you know a gift or a burden, of understanding if we have to define an aesthetic, if mm -hmm. we have to define a space and call it, you know, um, a black space. Yeah, but I, it's if, funny you're asking about now. I'm, it's like a couple steps forward and a few, you know, a couple steps back and a few steps forward, just generationally mm -hmm. thinking about, you know, Jack Witten and Melvin Edwards and them having, you know, uh, uh, you know, certain amount of commercial success now, mm -hmm. you know, in a way, generationally. I know that Dawood had written that article, The Disappearing Black Artist, mm -hmm. about that particular generation. Mm -hmm. It's nice that that article, which is several, several years ago, six, seven years ago, within actually a very short period of time, mm -hmm. to say that, oh, no, 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 they're no longer disappeared. <laughs> they're actually <laughs> here and well, in terms of at least, you know, um, having, having shows and recognition about their work. Mm -hmm. But thinking about the William Popel show mm -hmm. that's up mm -hmm. now at MoCA and also with 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 Carrie James Marshall mm -hmm. like you know the idea to me is that they're actually born in the same year mm -hmm. just as far as mm -hmm. like generation you know going f um, uh, but them occupying opposite ends of a certain kind of spectrum I mean you can't think of two more antithetical artists in a certain way than those two. Yeah. But I, but at the same time, I feel like it's like, uh, oh, that is interesting to be here now, to have them. It's like, that's a lot of space. You know, when you're talking mm -hmm. about like, a, you know, a black aesthetic or, mm -hmm. a, or having to define it or fix it, it's like, no, 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 no. Now it's like, it feels like the, 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 the number of options, like what you can do, mm -hmm. you know, it's wide open field, if mm -hmm. these are your two you know, two kind of poles way of thinking about something. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what's interesting. So, I mean, because I, I guess what I was really struck by, because I'm, I, I mean, I wasn't around at least as, a, as an artist in the 90s, but I was living as an, um, as, you know, just living in the world. But like, I really relate to the urgency. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I teach, uh, like I teach at UCLA, I often teach uh, the 1993 Whitney Biennial. I show the artists in that, um, um, that were in that, in that show 
and black male, and a lot of my students have a sense of urgency, and I have a complete sense of urgency. But it's interesting, I guess I'm, I'm wondering how, like, I, I guess I was curious about like, w like where the urgency resides within an institutional space. Mm. Um, and that's kind of like. I think it depends which kind of institution well, you're talking about. You no, know, it definitely, it definitely does, and it definitely depends on the um, individuals. But it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, I guess I'm just, I'm interested in that kind of like call and response between artists and curators and how that mm. um, gets generated. Because yeah. maybe, you know, maybe I'm romanticizing that time period, but I'm imagining that, you know, uh, cura curators are also um, thinking of ideas that they wanted to respond to and like reaching out. To like to be a part of a to like create a dialogue mm -hmm. in the sense of like well I have this idea mm -hmm. like uh, mm -hmm. let's address this issue mm -hmm. in a certain way and I mean maybe that's a, a mischaracterization of how uh, certain shows like Black Male were were no, created or it, it's not at all I mm -hmm. mean in the case of Black Male Black Male was an exhibition that was completely created one for me as a curator mm -hmm. at the Whitney Museum, at the time the exhibition began to bubble, it was around 92, 93, mm -hmm. while I was working on the 1993 Biennial. Um, but it really was an exhibition that was in response to artists presenting me mm -hmm. with a set of possibilities. Mm -hmm. Some of them were actual object-based possibilities, mm -hmm. but some were ideas. Mm -hmm. It was also, though, a sense of responsibility I had, you know? Mm -hmm. um, you know, sort of course, after, you know, Chris Rock's film, Top Five, right? We're all, yeah. you know, invested in our top five. And, you know, for me, you know, in my top five, the top four definitely have always been Charles Gaines, Adrian Piper, David Hammonds, Robert Colescott. Mm -hmm. And um, really, um, it was very important, in, in many ways, Black Male was an exhibition deeply informed by Adrian Piper. Mm. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. in my mind, oh, wow. mm -hmm. I was looking for a space mm -hmm. to somehow encapsulate all that mythic being meant. Like, in my mind, mm -hmm. I thought, well, can I create a space for that? And that's really how the narrative of that exhibition began. It also happened because Gary Simmons came to me with a profoundly amazing installation idea that could mm -hmm. not be realized, which is why I won't mm -hmm. repeat it, because we always say he might right. 20 years later. Really fantastic mm -hmm. idea. We could not do it. But it also was the other end of that spectrum, mm -hmm. right? For you know Adrian's work that was in the show, The Cool, Gary had this incredibly, incredibly hot idea idea that was formed kind of in his mind, but to me began. Mm -hmm. It came because Glenn Ligon had made his first paintings in color with the Richard Pryor, the first Richard oh, Pryor yeah. paintings, oh, wow. really, which yeah. he wasn't really ready to show. And I sort of, you Smashed know, said, yeah. yeah, you know. So it was an exhibition completely in response. And it was actively engaged with artists because, you know, there I was, and that's what's so interesting in thinking about 20 years ago. I was a, you know, sort of 27-year-old African-American woman curator at the Whitney Museum of American Art making a show about images of black masculinity and therefore <laughs> deeply engaged with artists in this idea that we had no idea what the life of that exhibition was going to be once it opened. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, this was all new space being actively made right then, right there. And mm -hmm. so it was, you know, David Ross, who was director of the Whitney at that time and really responsible and gets so much credit for creating the space for me mm -hmm. to have the voice I had, you know, said to me, yeah. you have to be an active co-conspirator with artists. Yeah. And that's exactly right. what. It was also, though, I have to say, you know, a little bit, you know, of the way in which we all live with our own neuroses. I didn't know how long I was going to be there. <laughs> so, you know, uh, some of it was just like, you know, for my 30th birthday, a few years later, Glenn Lycon made a um, proposed cover for my um, autobiography at some point, and the title he proposed is, I'm curating as fast as I can. Awesome. Because <laughs> that's what that was then. Yeah. It was just, you know, how to make that happen. But I think, you know, we definitely felt that urgency, right, in that moment, right? Because oh, yeah. there was a lot of opportunity as well. Mm -hmm. 
we had lots of opportunity as young curators in this space that multiculturalism created, you know, literally standing on the shoulders of all of those professionals who'd become before us, mm -hmm. many of whom who did not have institutional relationships like we had, me at the Whitney, you at the Wren, mm -hmm. who didn't have directors like we had, mm -hmm. me, David Ross, yeah. you, Suzanne Gez, who did not have a generation of artists who also right. had agency, right, yeah. that we could then work with and galvanize. And it really, in some ways, it allowed for what at least you know makes me proud as you know Hamza's younger than I am but as I say as we're you know getting on to see this whole generation that's come behind us of curators who now can do this without mm -hmm. maybe say the sense of urgency that we felt um, though there's still the need mm -hmm. for urgency I'm not saying we don't yeah, need right. it but they can work in ways that are broad and expansive right. yeah but it was definitely like, through the dialogue, like with you about the chair and have, like mm -hmm. having to sit down and have that, mm -hmm. like being an active co-conspirator, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. the back and mm -hmm. forth, mm -hmm. and took that made the thing happen as mm -hmm. opposed to a more of a top-down model. It isn't at all like I had an idea as much as it was just like mm -hmm. seeing work out there and just being like, oh, this is kind of, you know, instigating the discussion. Yeah. But it's also about generations, because one of the things that I know we we all acknowledge as really also one of what will be uh, Charles's great legacy is his role as a teacher, oh, yeah. and that yeah. kind of you know intergenerational mm -hmm. exchange of ideas and the sort of you know intellectual and emotional and spiritual nurturing. Mm -hmm that he has done for so many artists that then carry that with them and do it for others. And I think also in terms when you're talking about that moment and the now, I think our commitment to continue to think about that, mm -hmm. right, as an example of a practice, yeah. right? Not just an art practice, but this practice of how we um, collectively sort of engage in this project, right? Yeah. And even if we don't name it, you know, or we name it with many names, that mm -hmm. we understand it as a project and understand it as important to making what we all imagine needs to happen for the presentation of work by artists of African descent, however we call it exactly. from, in aesthetic terms, to make that possible. Right? Yeah. Do we want to take some questions? I could, yeah. I, I mean, obviously I could keep talking to both of yeah. you, certainly mm -hmm. all evening in many ways, mm -hmm. but I know there are microphones, uh, there they are, oh, look at this, and they have coordinated yeah. shirts and everything. <laughs> I know. I love this, oh my gosh, hey, the hammer, do you see this? I, I know. Hey, this I'm this like is so fantastic. They are a team. If you raise well, your hand, you know, they will come to it. you. I can see, yes. Hello. Hello. Um, what a pleasure, what an honor to hear you all speak. My name is Eve Kemp, and uh, I came to hear this subject based on uh, my thoughts about the 21st century. Hi, Thelma, I wrote you, and you wrote me back. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, um, I'm listening to you. I feel so in the 21st when I, uh, century when I hear these things. Um, as an artist, I'm completely self-taught. I was just at the California African American Museum for eight months, extended twice. And I listened to the language, which I'm uh, so impressed by. I kind of went out many years ago, lived in Europe, traveled out there with nothing, and saw art from more of a European perspective as a, as a, a black. But I was born and raised in Flint, Michigan. So mm -hmm. concept and ideas and language. And this is very New York. and. We're in Los Angeles, and I'm from Michigan, and I've lived in Europe, and I talked to 40-year-old art historians from Europe. I'm hearing such a brilliancy here. Um, and at the same time, I have a sense of something's already been done, and here where I am, it all feels so new mm -hmm. and so exceptional, like the history is being written like something is happening uh, uh, dynamically uh, between you and us, the artists, uh, and you as artists, that I'm wondering, is it really the way uh, the term it, black, is that going to be the issue, the, the point of taking it historically into the future? Or is it going to be about it dissolving and fading into art? Right. You know, about 
Let me think. I've been at the Studio Museum now for 15 years, and I would say about seven years ago, I decided I wasn't going to try and answer that question anymore. Mm -hmm. No, because if I thought about, you know, how many hours I spent trying to answer it, and then I, you know how you always hear that thing, like how many hours we watch TV and then you gain back like three years of your life, mm -hmm. you stop watching TV. For me, that question, it also is because, you know, the beauty, you know, and this is something Hamza and I talked about privately, but, you know, I have to say something, and I'll say it, you know, deeply out loud, but, you know, working at a culturally specific institution, I love, you know, the sort of freedom that black space creates for you, because I don't really have to ask that question when I'm mm -hmm. in my space. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Right? Um, you know, sort of a funny thing that um, happened once at the Studio Museum in our PR department. We had an, a little argument with a journalist who resented the fact that we did not say that an artist we were showing was African American. But my thing, that's kind of like, well, it's coming from us, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I would tell you if it weren't. That's where I feel I have to give you some clarity. You know what I mean? Like, but if if you know, it's that, you see, what I mean? yeah. you, you know, like, and so I think that you know, your question is completely and totally valid. But I also think what's going to happen is I don't know if the question's going to be that it dissolves. I think we have more worlds to live in, and in those different worlds, there are just different terms to this debate. You're welcome. I think there are different activisms within those worlds, too. Mm -hmm. I find them both so necessary. Yeah. My art has never been seen as a It's my art. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, it's, it's very funny. I uh, was talking from things I'd like to quote Carrie about was uh, this idea of Carrie James Marshall mm -hmm. about the designation about being a, a black artist. And he said, no, 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 no. I, I want to be a black artist, right. and that, that's really funny. And he says that he goes no, and it, and what's wrong with that? And like, which is very interesting, and just generationally about exactly. that generation that said they didn't want to be black artists right. and wanted to get rid of the term, mm -hmm. as opposed to him saying now. But I think that's really what's at the heart of this issue. It's actually not about you know about race in 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 a, in, a, in, a, in any kind of essentialized or or reductivist kind of way. It has a lot more to do. When I think about it on the terms that Carrie is raising the, the issue, it has to do with the artist and the audience, right. and mm -hmm. who is speaking for whom, right. and the idea that when he says he wants to be a black artist, the thing he's and his the idea that the art is avowedly not autonomous, and right. to say it's like no, 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 I may, you know, I, I, I. I, I that's where the power is is having an audience, like the ability to speak for someone to be granted that power and to reciprocate you know in a way and why would you want to give that up you know in a certain sense so that's where where, where i think that that issue for her, yeah is really yeah. you know and if you bring back the oh yeah. sorry up here <laughs> oh um I, if, yeah i like the idea of post black um when it kind of first came out it seemed like it was appropriate but now, I mean, just given the popularity of everything black, mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. especially hip hop mm -hmm. um, and rap, of course, I, I think we're in a crisis. Like in Los Angeles, there's not one African-American history class in all of Southern California. And, and what they did at my college, um, they had one, one um, they integrated black artists into the the canon of mm -hmm. art period and then they skipped over it mm -hmm. um, I had a contemporary art class they had one piece of Rodney's work just one piece mm -hmm. and the teacher just skipped over it Ooh. and he, he had the picture though you know <laughs> that's it and the title but uh, didn't talk about it at all and just talked about international art just went on to Iranian art and Japanese art and how it's all global now globalism um, and then um, also, oh, there was also a lady in line who said that she heard the same thing that's going on. But there's this whole Mesoamerican art and Latin art and Mexican art, but and that was supposed to be sort of mixed into the canon of um, American art as well. But that's not skipped over. They have there's whole departments in Cal State LA, but not one African American art class or not one teacher who will talk about it. 
Mm -hmm. um, and who's going to write about African American art in LA, or, or forgive me, about anybody black <laughs> mm -hmm. um, in in LA if there's no history, like nobody's talking about it. And then the last quick question, um, I remember reading an article a while back that said that um, the, the revisionist writers were uh, adding us into the canon, you know, starting with abstractionist, Al Loving and so Wilfredo Lamb and all that. But um, they were w sort of um, skipping over conceptual artists, even though they were in um, major exhibitions worldwide, major um, collections worldwide, and only creating a narrative of black artists being figurative, mm -hmm. and just like leaving us out, just again, just skipping over it, as if we were in denial <laughs> or something about um, uh, conceptualism. And I just wanted you to think about those two things. Yeah, I think you, thank you. You bring up a lot of really profound and pressing issues which really have to do with art history. And um, it's still sort of problematic stance around certain kinds of revisionisms. And that mm -hmm. is really the work that needs to be done. Every single thing you brought up is a whole area of work that has to be done. And for some of us, it's the, the urgency that still exists is about that, right? So it's about new art histories that adequately look at kind of a, a certain kind of parity around practices. It's about these issues of inclusion. It's about the ways in which the sort of teaching of art history acknowledges um, you know, different modes of documentation. And it's just about the real work of kind of understanding the contributions, right, of a wide range of artists when we begin to talk about black art and black artists. I will say, however, that while you're experiencing, you know, perhaps um, the worst aspect of this, we do have many colleagues engaged in really important sort of, you know, very transformative art historical work mm -hmm. in universities all over this country. There's a whole generation of people doing the work and writing the books, and it's my hope that that is is what will begin to address um, some of what you are speaking of. Okay. Oh, and that was us ten years ago. No, <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know neither of us were this gray at that yeah, time, Yeah, I think right? the, yeah, I know. <laughs> right? I, I think I yeah. remember uh, the, yeah. the, 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 uh, that panel, because mm -hmm. that was the panel at which um, I, I made the disclaimer about being, uh, somebody was asking a question, and I said, no, 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 I'm not an African-Americanist. Right. And yeah, and, right. and Thelma looked down across the table at me, oh, oh, like this round table thing, and she said, Listen to you, part-time black man. But again, ten years as ago, I, as I okay. said, we had work to do, Hamza, <laughs> and you couldn't, you know. <laughs> and I didn't feel you could be engaged in it as a part-time job. I mean, no, it's, when it's I was working overtime. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Division of labor. Yeah, like, exactly. Not, yeah, That's what it was call about. Out on it. Yeah. A question yeah. on this side, yes. As a collector of Gary Simmons and, you know, I know Rodney's work, I feel it's so important, it's just a comment, that the present is where we have to, <coughs> excuse me, the present is where we create from. Mm -hmm. And, you know, blackmail, and there was so much work when we started carrying, collecting Gary 15 years ago and people come into our home and they see Gary's work and they don't know his work, many different minorities of people and don't know that he's an African-American artist. In terms of where we go, I think we have to keep doing what we're doing. And there is many information, much, so much information out about our jazz musicians, about our artists that at the time, it felt like it wasn't being documented. Mm -hmm. but now with all of these different social media outlets, that work lives. So whether the art history classes are in the Los Angeles colleges, I am so encouraged by the artists and by you, Thelma, and by Rodney to keep doing what you're doing because my children will find the work as a result of you doing what you're doing. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Thanks. you.
from the University of Minnesota. Mm -hmm. um. Hi, um, I just had a quick question. Mm -hmm. um, wait, uh, <laughs> could, can I ask you just wait one oh, sec? Yeah. You're next, but <laughs> we have a gentleman right here from the University of Minnesota. <laughs> sorry, right? Oh, I'm Art. so sorry. No, it's okay. Art's a functional language. Uh, once it doesn't function as a, as a language, it, uh, it can go off into many other places. Mm -hmm. But no matter where you're at on the planet, art is art. And anything that's not art is non-art. So it doesn't matter who's making it. However, on the other hand, there's a certain experience that there are certain people have that can come through, that experience can come through their art so that we can tell some other people mm -hmm. about what the experience was. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Hi, I just had a quick question. Um, I know that uh, you mentioned the term earlier before, new Negro, and I wonder if you think there are parallels now to the term new black, and if sometimes the problems that um, lots of black artists have with having being labeled like black conceptualists or black um, experimentalists or black video artists is sometimes they want more um, granular definitions mm -hmm. like, uh, you know, like black post punk mm -hmm. conceptualist or something. Because sometimes just the term can seem limiting, but they, they want the term black, but also just more variation within the term, mm -hmm. too. Want to take that home, so? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I think, well, the new Negro. I mean, that's a, you know the Harlem Renaissance. I mean, that's a specific historically as a as a which I actually really love actually. <laughs> um, one of the things that I actually was going to show at one point uh, was as an example of how I like to think about Charles's work um, outside of the kind of movement which is associated was is. Uh, an image of, of uh, Gerald Eans, mm -hmm. which is, oh, is yeah. the mm -hmm. abstract biomorphic mm -hmm. forms, mm -hmm. alongside uh, er, alongside Aaron Douglas. Mm -hmm. um, in which case, you know, these Aaron, Gerald Eans, you know, uh, uh, Gerald must be, I mean, close to mid forties, mm -hmm. uh, uh, seventy, yeah, and um, they are biomorphic abstractions, you know, you know, against Aaron Douglas's work, and I like to think about Gerald's work. As an extent, like I call you know the new new Negro <laughs> in a way, in terms of going from, um, you know, uh, 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 a figurative, geometric kind of abstraction mm -hmm. into this complete abstraction, but they're totally in dialogue in terms of like forms and color to me, without missing a beat. So it just dissolves this idea about abstraction and about figuration mm -hmm. um, that I find really quite quite beautiful. But the in terms of now with a new black, I mean I. I am probably a little more suspect um, mm -hmm. as far as um, its uh, and we're gonna say the word market um, there being a, a, a I guess if I were just to the new black, a new black, uh, the thing that I guess is alongside that for me would be new black or new black face, um, in a sense, in terms of like, for whom, what's going on, uh, just some suspicions sometimes, um, just to yeah. let whatever hair I have down yeah, just on that terms. <laughs> uh, I'm also very close with the Aster Gates, and, and in terms of, I you know have had in terms of like, conversations about performance and everything and we had once a very incredible discussion um i just said you know about like you know the spirituals singing dancing and like a black art is a really that dynamic i felt uncomfortable with the dynamic and i said you know this kind of comes across to me as a sort of a a new a new a new uh a new black face of sorts and sometimes it's hard to it's like wait a minute are you, um, uh, but you seem to be wholly self-conscious about this. And there seems to be a moment, and he just picked up my thought uh, right without missing a beat. And he said, yeah, it's like wiping off the makeup, but then 
I forget, like, there might be, like, a little smudge left or something. And I was like, God damn, that's pretty good, <laughs> you know? But just in terms of, like, yeah. even within the terms of a new blackface, is there some kind of, like, criticality or self-reflexivity about this and what's going on? So it can kind of double back on itself. And that, again, is just yet another space, yeah. you know? So, so it's even hard to even have a value judgment about that, you know? But, again, it's just, like, lots of stuff going on. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Um, I'd like to, so the title of this panel is A History of Re Refusal. Um, the Theater of Refusal. The Theater of Refusal. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Okay, well, on this, anyway, Refusal is in the, the title. Um, and I, I'd like to hear the panel talk more about something that Rodney read in the beginning. Um, this idea of the conceptual versus the perceptual, um, because I think it relates to that idea of uh, the history of refusal or the theater of refusal and it being a political gesture. Um, so if you guys could talk a little bit more about that, that'd be great. Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, well, it, it was based on this idea that uh, through conceptual practices, you could get at a critical space with art. And, um, and the way that Charles set up his, his practice, or his, I guess the thinking of his practice, uh, he was invested in the idea that art um, has a critical space, which was one that is uh, all about language. And it, open, and it could open up a space for political art. And the way that I understand a lot of his works and a lot of his texts was about, was about, I think he was kind of, I think he was quite aware of the fact that he was a bit of a bridge um, mm -hmm. in terms of like trying to figure out a way to justify political art. And, um, and I think it's a, it's a challenging, it's a, it's a, it's a challenging um, endeavor um, because it doesn't often reap a lot of rewards. Mm -hmm. um, it's, not a, it's not a practice that um, is very sexy. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's definitely not one that is, um, that is uh, uh, embraced by market forces. I mean, there may be some curators or some institutions that will support that work, but um, often it's about creating a discursive space. And I think somebody spoke earlier about the fact that, um, you could have said, like, like you said that somebody said that uh, race is a downer, um, but talking about race is a downer, but actually it could be quite constructive and lively, and I actually find political discourse to be really engaging. And so for me, that, um, that fourth paragraph, and, and then Charles is kind of like um, expansion upon s some of those ideas that Lewitt uh, laid out, provides a space for a kind of, uh, for, for a political voice. And um, I, I brought it up because that's what I'm really engaged in. I'm, ac I'm actually like, um, what's the word that, it wasn't emphatic, it was, uh, there was something, it wasn't something at stake, but anyway, that space that you're in in 94, mm -hmm. 93, that's the space that I'm in, that I'm in now. Mm -hmm. And perhaps I've always been in right. since I became an artist. And so I'm really intrigued by uh, strategies of not only keeping that kind of um, necessity mm -hmm. uh, in circulation, but I'm also curious about the potential for there to be a, uh, I'm also curious about how institutions and other places could also like have that uh, urgency. Yeah. That's the word, yeah, yeah. urgency. Because mm -hmm. um, I do see it in certain institutions. I do see it with certain curators. I do see it with certain artists. But it is interesting that there's a expansive field where there is not a sense of, of urgency. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I think that's why um, I'm so indebted and grateful for the work that um, Charles did because um, with it, you can't escape it. It's, it's, it's built in to, to the act of making art. Yeah. And in the space of that moment, the moment of the theater of refusal, the exhibition and the conference um, that I participated in, um, you know, there was this idea that sort of Charles put on the table in sort of you know, coalescing a lot of critical theory, but speaking about the idea that the formation of ideas is often driven by the need for power, not truth. Right? And that there could be a kind of conceptualism, particularly in the artists that he presented in that exhibition, that were also seeking, right, through their yeah. work, to define a space of a truth. 
And that I also think is what is an important sort of legacy of that moment of understanding the particular quality of the sort of idea of the conceptual versus the perceptual in art at that moment. This idea of looking for a truth. Yeah. What was interesting with mm -hmm. um, in showing him the cut, the draft version of Black Is, mm -hmm. his response, uh, given the kind of work that he makes, the, the thing, funny enough, that he responded to the most um, uh, like viscerally was actually were these two photographs by Andre Serrano, and it was quite beautiful that the, the um, thinking about his own okay. interrogation about the image. Um, uh, uh, in another way, mm -hmm. he was very in looking at these pictures. It's funny, Charles. These. Um, uh, it's still the difference between the conceptual and the perceptual. Like, not that that, it, it wasn't ideological. It wasn't about abolishing the image or um, negating it. I mean, which is one of the things, you know, they think about conceptual art and it's rigor, dismantling like visuality and sustained fashion, you know, critique the image. Um, but at the same time, I feel like that was all, to, to make all the more powerful in some sense, like, you know, uh, 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 the foundations for being able to allow something to be visual, like to really, mm -hmm. for it to then be reasserted in a more, um, uh, uh, um, aggressive, but, uh, but something about picture making mm -hmm. and the image is just, you know, so when, even though it has that title, like theater of refusal, like it has such a strong, mm -hmm. stringent thing about it, I feel like no, 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 no. This was he was quite a dialectical mm -hmm. thinker in that way. Open space. Yeah. I think we have time for one more question. Yes. All right, I guess we're gonna have two because Jamila, uh, you know, you can give her one and then two. Okay. One and Hi, yes. my name is Patrick Henry Johnson, and I understand the conversation that you guys are having about black and race and such and so forth. As an artist, a conceptual linguistic expressionist, I Ooh. believe that if you endeavor to create work that is authentic to your experience, mm -hmm. it will transcend whatever race you are. Mm -hmm. And it will speak to the collection of folk who vibrates on that same frequency. Mm -hmm. And I think that once artists speak from that space, I think all, it, all everything will work itself out. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I definitely wouldn't Amen. Disagree with that. <laughs> right. Okay. I want to thank you. Thanks. I want to thank you all for coming and being here and being with us tonight. And my question is: um, considering that the curatorial field is expanding with graduate programs that are you know, making young curators and such. My question for you, Thelma, and also Hamza, is in, 19, in the 1990s when you first came to the Whitney, as a black curator, was there an expectation for you to work with specifically artists of color? And is, do you think that that expectation still carries on and that will be the cross to bear for later generations of curators mm -hmm. of color? Um. I think that when I began working at the Whitney in the late 80s, when I first started working at the Whitney to begin making shows in the early 90s, um, there was an expectation um, that I would address the exclusion of black artists in the art world writ large. That expectation, however, was different coming from different people, right? So. It was a different expectation internally than it was externally, right? And in some ways, the internal expectations were just the normal realm of sort of, you know, how one might think of their professional career. The external expectations, however, um, were incredibly great because of the absence of what felt like a sense of agency around creating change in that way. I think that in the moments that I did not acknowledge that this could be, right, um, a crippling burden, I 
took it as a real privilege to then see the responsibility of the space that I had to kind of work in it in ways that could be profound and pr powerful and productive. So that it did not feel as if while Yes, the expectation was there. I own that expectation. You know, it's sort of like my work has always been not so much what's pushing me. And yes, those expectations were what were pushing me. You know, I used to come in many days to the Whitney and say, I really do not want to be the black curator at the Whitney today, you know, because <laughs> that just came with about five other jobs on top of my real job. <laughs> um, but on the other hand, on the other hand, um, that space is where my most profound work got to happen because it was the work that truly, truly was transformative. Now, um, as you know, Jamila, because you um, have worked with me, I would love it to be, um, you know, I want all of you to be more like Hamza in the part sense. Part time. <laughs> <laughs> Not no part time at all. Hamza's been full time for a long time now, okay? He's been full time for a long time now. But to really understand um, that this ability to work with multiple generations of artists who are so brilliant and so fierce and so full of what we understand to be the power of art is not a burden, right? There's a gift in that. And the gift is what I hope that yes, you know, when the space is created for you, that you all can work in to produce you know, what can be the profound change that I think we all want to see and see all of these artists like Charles Gaines, whose, you know, legacy is enormous, be acknowledged appropriately. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. It's been a great pleasure to be here and to be with you both. Thank you. Thanks.